generated a lot of discussion. I got bombarded with emails, uh, other theories, alternative views, and I thought that it would be useful then to pause for a second before we resume the narrative and to kind of unpack and discuss why I am hesitant to go down this road of metaphorical or symbolic interpretation. As we mentioned, there are interpretations uh, advocated by very famous online personalities. There's a very famous preacher somewhere in the Caribbean islands. Uh, all, and since he's still alive, I'd rather not mention his name. I don't like to. There's nothing personal. I don't know the brother or the sheikh. I have nothing against him. I wish him all the best. But I don't like to have anything personal like this. If a person has passed on, we can mention his name. So, for example, Dr. Isar Ahmed, may Allah have mercy on him, a great thinker from Pakistan. He as well had his interpretation of Ya'juj and Ma'juj that I am well aware of. And I respectfully uh, disagree uh, with these political interpretations that Ya'juj and Ma'juj essentially become uh, superpowers of our times and the Jal becomes some type of globalization force. Maybe it's the World Economic Forum, maybe it is the Global Bank, IMF, or something of this nature. And I understand there's a lot to criticize about the IMF, but it's not the Dajjal that the Prophet Sassam predicted. Okay, I understand we're angry at the superpowers and we have a lot to criticize, but that's not yet juj and ma'juj. And, and that's my humble opinion. Now, why? Why am I hesitant to go down this route? I will explain. And this is a bit of a tangent, but it is a very important theological tangent that is necessary to understand not just Judgment Day, not just Ashrat al Sa'a, but also the Quran and Sunnah overall. You see, our methodology is to understand the Qur'an and Sunnah at face value. We don't believe the Qur'an and Sunnah is speaking to us in riddles. We don't believe the Qur'an and Sunnah is symbolic. When Allah says X, He doesn't mean X, He means Y. No, we don't do this. We say when Allah says X, He means X. This is the standard mainstream interpretation of Islam. Why? Because to claim that any speaker, any speaker, when he means X, he doesn't mean X. When he says X, he doesn't mean X. This is one of three reasons. Number one, the speaker is uninformed. He makes a mistake. The speaker says the capital of uh, France is Rome. He doesn't know any better. He makes a mistake. Number two, the speaker knows the truth but wants to deceive you. This is ill-intentioned. So either the speaker is ignorant or the speaker has an evil intention or the speaker made an honest mistake or cannot communicate properly. They don't have the grasp of the language, so the words they're using, they're not imparting the wisdom that they have in their minds. Otherwise, if the speaker knows his stuff, and the speaker desires sincerity and truth, and the speaker is eloquent, then what the speaker says is what is understood by the audience. You see what I'm saying here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not lie. Woman astaqu min Allahi qila. Woman astaqu min Allahi haditha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alam al ghuyub. Alim al ghaybi wa shahada. Al alim al khabir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the best of all speech. No one speaks better than Allah, obviously. Khayrul kalam. That is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions the Qur'an as being بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍّ مُبِينٍ It is in clear Arabic. And Allah says, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ We have revealed the Qur'an in Arabic so that you can understand it. So Allah is saying, I said it in Arabic so that you can understand. Not so that you can read in symbols. Not so that you can read in other things. So to claim that what Allah says is not intended is to claim that the Qur'an is a fairy tale. The Qur'an is fables. And this is not the claim of the Muslim. This is the claim of those who rejected Islam. Allah says in the Qur'an, when the Qur'an is recited to them, they say, in awwalin. These are myths of old. These are myths of old. So we now have some people saying, Oh, Adam and Hawa, these are mythological figures. And the Qur'an is simply narrating a fable. Now, the issue of uh, evolution and the Qur'an, this is another topic. Insha'Allah, it is my goal to talk about it one day. But my point is, some Muslims who want to preserve the Qur'an, 
They say, so how do we reconcile? They have a philosophy. What is that philosophy? Adam wasn't a real person. Allah Azza wa Jal knows there's no such thing as Adam. But you see the mind of that 7th century Arabian mindset. Allah is communicating with that mindset by talking about the fables that they knew. Now why is this problematic? It is problematic because the accusation is that A'udhu Billah, Allah is intentionally deceiving. The Quran doesn't say it's a fable. You see, when Allah wants to set up a metaphor, Allah says, Darab Allahu Mathala. Allah is giving you an example. When Allah wants to set a parable, a simile, when Allah wants to give you a metaphor, He says it. He says it. I'm giving you an example. This is the example. And when Allah is telling you a story from the past, then Allah says, These aren't asatir, these aren't fables. This is the truth. These qasas are true, Allah says. So when somebody comes along and says, Oh, Adam and Eve is a fable, it's not real. Then you are accusing, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah, the Quran of lying, or Allah of lying, and the Quran of being full of fables. Now, the exact same philosophy goes for these signs of judgment day. The exact same philosophy. Because it is the same book. And if Allah and His Messenger say something about the future that is very clear about what they are saying, then the default is that it is interpreted in a literal manner. Because here's another problem. When we open this door, where do we stop? If we say the Quran is symbolic, if we say the Quran is full of symbols, then what if somebody says, oh, that means the Sharia is also symbolic? Salah is not really Salah. Hajj is not really Hajj. Sawm is not really Sawm. And there are interpretations of Islam in the non-mainstream groups. You know, the, uh, for example, the Ismaili Nizari group, for example, those, you, those of you who know, you know, the Ismaili groups in Indian Pakistan, that famous firqa that we are all aware of in our homelands. They have a metaphorical interpretation of the Sharia. So they say, and I'm not yani, billah, trying to make fun of, I'm telling you the fact, this is truth. Hajj is not to go to the Kaaba, it is to see the Imam. You see, they say, you Muslims, the mainstream Muslims, you take the Quran literally. Hajj is not to go to the house of Allah, Hajj is to visit the Imam. That's the Hajj. Whoever visits the Imam has done the Hajj. And the Sawm is this and that. So they interpret the Arkan al-Islam metaphorically. Now, those of you that want to go down this route with signs of judgment day, what would you say to them? They will say, well, we're doing exactly what you're doing. People have gone even more than this. Heaven and hell don't really exist. There's states of the mind. It's metaphorical. There is no actual heaven and hell. This is just something that Allah is speaking to, to people that don't have any intelligence. Allah is speaking to backward. This is their thing. They claim to be Muslim, by the way. I'm not making this up. There are famous people. Yani Avicenna was one of them, for example. And again, that's a, a deep topic that yani, you know, we'll, maybe one day we'll get to it. But Ibn Sina was of this mindset. He literally felt there's no such thing as heaven and hell. It's something that yeah, this, Allah is telling it to these backward people. They don't know any better. These are fables. Al-Farabi is also of this nature. So the point is that when you open this door, when you open this door, there is no end to it. Now, does this mean that there is no eloquence in metaphorical language at all? And here is where we get to the, the, the conundrum. Obviously, mainstream Muslims say, of course, there's an element of eloquence. Sometimes there is a metaphorical phrase. That's how we speak. We say in English, he was caught red-handed. And caught red-handed means what? He's guilty. Okay, it doesn't mean his hand was red. Okay, we say that, oh, he had a hand in that. He had a hand in that means he was involved in the affair. We use some type of metaphor here. So obviously, there's some type of metaphor. To what level? This is a much more deeper question. And if you know anything about Islamic theology, about aqidah, you know that this was the main issue of controversy throughout our history regarding to what level do we understand Allah's attributes literally. And we have one one movement that took everything literally we have the exact opposite the mu'tazila who took everything metaphorically we had another group that felt itself being middle ground will take some metaphorically and others literally and that's the whole question that uh, involves theology my point is when it comes to the signs of judgment day 
I'm willing to concede maybe one phrase that might make sense to use as a metaphor is used as a metaphor. For example, when you say the phrase, he was caught red-handed, it is a well-known expression. It is something that is understood, that it means he was guilty. But when you have dozens of ayat and a hadith describing Ya'juj and Ma'juj, describing the Jal, describing what the Jal is going to do, and you say all of this is metaphorical, that is a big danger. Hence, why I personally am willing to allow a little bit of imagination. So, for example, when the Prophet ﷺ said, a hole of this size has been opened in the wall between us and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I'm willing, I'm willing to say this could be a type of simile or metaphor that we are a little bit closer to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. It doesn't have to mean, because you know, we can say, oh, he's a little bit closer. We make a sign with our hands. We don't literally mean this closer. We can get this point across and it is understood. So for example, that hadith I'm willing to negotiate with and say, because you heard my interpretation that I personally... I'm very skeptical because the Quran and Sunnah, we can easily argue, does not mention Ya'juj and Ma'juj are still around. It is true that has been the historical understanding. I'll be the first to admit that. But I believe, as I said last week, a rethinking is in order given that uh, it is somewhat problematic to believe this in our times. And Allah knows best. So that's the first issue, metaphorical language. That I simply am not willing to go down this route of saying all of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is metaphorical. All of Dajjal is metaphorical because that opens up a very dangerous door, number one. Number two, it goes against what the Quran and Sunnah says about itself. The Quran and Sunnah describes itself as being eloquent, as being that which is understood, that which is revealed in Arabic so that you can understand. Our Prophet said, I have been given the best and the most concise of all speech. He is afsahul arabi wal ajam. He is the most eloquent of Arab and ajam amongst human beings. So to say that, oh, he didn't know what he was saying is a very big problem. And it opens up theological problems that I'm not willing to go down. Jayid, this is the first issue. The second issue that some people brought to my attention that a group of uh, people who have left Islam uh, they also saw these videos of mine and they are using them to then say look you know this is a person who is openly acknowledging that Ya'juj yeah, and is a problematic issue then they are saying that if these stories make no sense then why are you still a Muslim they're trying to preach to other people to leave Islam and they said they say just like you would find stories of other faith groups problematic of this nature, and you would say this clearly shows their faith is wrong, why then do you not have the same bravery and courage of your own faith and say, look, these are stories and fables, and why do you believe in them? And the response is that we have a far deeper issue than simply Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and that is answering the question, why are you a Muslim? What brings Iman to your heart? Is it the story of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Are you a Muslim because of the story of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Obviously no. Why are you a Muslim? We are a Muslim because we have yaqeen that Allah is true, that the Quran is true, that the Prophet is true. Okay, how do you have that yaqeen? We have yaqeen because now we get to the deeper issue. And I'll just gloss over this. And that is the fact that Islam answers the big questions of life in a way that no other faith tradition does. The simplicity of the kalima, the simplicity of la ilaha illallah, no other faith tradition has it. The goal of life, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the revelation of the Quran, the power of the Quran, the impact of the Quran, the preservation of the Quran, the beauty of the Quran, the eloquence of the Quran, the content of the Quran, the, the, the message of the Prophet ﷺ in his whole life, his sincerity, the success of this single man to come in 7th century Arabia and change the entire course of history in a way that no human has ever done. Every single one of the big questions is answered by Islam. The Quran, Allah, the Akhirah, morality, all of this is answered. Now, Islam is a package deal. And within this package deal, there are tertiary issues. I'm not going to say illogical. I will say 
I have used the word suprarational, not superrational, by the way, supra, S-U-P-R-A. Suprarational means beyond the scope of rationality. The mind can neither affirm nor deny. And there are many examples. Uh, resurrection of the soul, the resurrection of the body, it is not illogical, but neither is it necessarily logical. It's beyond the existence of angels. Is this something that is logical, you can prove from the mind? Yes or no? No, but is it illogical? No, it's supra-rational, beyond rationality. Because there's a realm that the mind does not operate in. It's blank. And the problem of the philosophers and the problem of these pseudo-intellectuals, they feel the mind can operate in any arena. And that's false. Belief in Ya'juj and Ma'juj is one of those areas. It's not logical, I will admit can we salvage the tradition and make it neither logical or illogical? That's what I tried to do. Last lesson. Make it beyond the scope of reason and produce a theory that, okay, we're faithful to the text and we're still admitting uh, uh, or believing in Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Now, why then, the person will say, this person who doesn't believe in Islam, they will say, why then do you believe in these fables if they don't make any sense? And the response is, because these stories, these Qur'an and Sunnah, they come in the tradition we have yaqeen in. We have yaqeen because of other factors, not because of ya'juj and ma'juj. Once we have yaqeen, then we will accept everything the tradition comes with because the yaqeen is not built on these tertiary matters. And we quote here Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an when the Quraysh came to him and said, do you believe your companion says he went to Jerusalem and came back in one night? Now, it's not logical for a person of that time frame to go to Jerusalem and come back in one night. Neither is it impossible. Neither is it impo It's simply beyond, it's bizarre. It's atypical. But neither is it rational nor is it irrational. It is definitely a miracle. And Ibn Hisham says in his seerah, some people of weak iman they were troubled by this. There were some problems like what? The, in some new converts or whatever, they're like, what? We, he went one night and came back? That's so weird. What did Abu Bakr al-Siddiq say? And why is he called al-Siddiq? What did he say? If he said it, it's true. Why did Abu Bakr al-Siddiq say that? Because his iman in the Prophet was not based upon Isra al Mi'raj. It was based upon yaqeen. I know this man. I know he's sincere. I've seen sincerity from him from day one. I have seen the miracles. I've heard the Quran. I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One can also add as a Muslim, our heart is at peace. Our, our, our qalb has sakina. Our qalb and our fitra and our iman go in together. And we know deep to the core that Islam is true. Once we know Islam to be true, we come across this story that is perhaps problematic. We will have to deal with it with Iman in our hearts. If you don't have Iman in your heart, which is what these murtas basically are, then obviously everything of this nature will only increase your doubt. And nothing is to be done about them. Summun bukmun umyun fahum la yarji'un fahum la ya'qinun. And the fact of the matter is, and I've said this before, and I don't, it's not my intent to mock that group of people, but wallahi, I cannot help but say, those who reject Islam and become agnostic or atheist, they end up with even more nonsensical beliefs than Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I mean, the most obvious of which is the claim that this entirely, perfectly synchronized, meticulously balanced ecosystem in life as we know it, it just came about out of nothing. To me, that is a far bigger fairy tale than believing in Ya'juj and Ma'juj in a matter that we don't understand. Do you, do you see what I'm saying here? Right? To reject Islam brings about infinitely more complex problems than to believe in Islam and say, I don't fully understand Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Which is essentially what I'm saying from last week, that I don't have a 100% foolproof mechanism. I at the end gave two answers. Number one, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are tribes that will come towards the end of time that are descended from those original that Dhul Qarnayn locked up. 
Okay, that's a totally valid and legit answer, and I don't have any problem with that. Number two, which caused some consternation, and understandably some mockery and whatnot. And remember, I projected it to my friend's mouth, and I said it's there. But I didn't use any word, uh, a lot of people using a particular word. I did not use any word. I simply said, this could be a group of people that they are human and not yet not quite human. That's all that I said. And if you look at the characteristics Allahu alam, but some things do make sense. That's all that I said. I did not use any particular word because obviously using a word categorizes it into a genre of literature and movies that I'm not, I'm not comparing exactly. I'm simply saying there could be groups of people that something is wrong with them mentally, emotionally, and that might be a case because there are indications that that is the case and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. So these are the two points I wanted to mention.